You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Doing all these other things, and sometimes rather than going around and trying to get sort of go around to the agents and managers and producers and try and get permission to do something or, you know, or get them to approve what you've done so that they can then go out and market it. If you really just go into the trenches with it and just, you know, try and try and figure out a way to get it done yourself or that, that may be more productive ultimately. Hey everyone, thanks again for hitting that play button. Before I get to today's episode, I just want to say thank you to Todd Matthews. Todd has listened to every episode of this podcast. Uh, He has listened to all 123 episodes. It's actually probably about a 120 because the first three are considered lost, as some of you may know, who've been listening from the very beginning. And that's when I had that old setup, if you recall, and every that recorder I used to use would always fail, and finally I said, screw it, and I started doing it in my office now. Uh, so if you if you could, please give Todd a follow. It's at Todd underscore Matthews on Twitter, and I'll link to it in the show notes at BigBoss.com. But uh, Todd, it, they, I want to say thank you very much for listening to every single episode and for asking questions for, for the guests. And, uh, you know, this is this is why I've been doing this, everybody. You know, not only just to create something, but again, you know, this is all morphed where it's something where we, we're all learning from, our, from these guests, you know, and, and this is, uh, you know, our show. And that's why I really encourage, you know, feedback. I really encourage, uh, you know, asking questions. And it really makes us really more interactive, which is like what I really were, were, were shooting for. And uh, speaking of interactive, you know, the guest I have on this week, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a fantastic guest. Uh, not that the other ones aren't, but, you know, uh, this guest and I have been talking for a while about him coming on. Uh, I actually, you know, uh, was talking to him about starting his own podcast, which he actually did, uh, which I, I will link to in the show notes. Uh, this guest is the one half of the ScreenwritingMasterclass.com. Uh, some of you recall I've interviewed Scott uh, Mayers before, who was the other half of Screenwriting Masterclass. Uh, you know, my guest this week has written and rewritten screenplays for Robert Zemeckis, Lawrence Kasdan, uh, you know, uh, Richard uh, Donner, Ron Howard, Martin Scorsese, Sidney Pollock, just to name a few. He's written screenplays for Cocoon, Zeus and Roxanne, The Adventures of Pinocchio, and others. This is episode 124 with guest Tom Benedict. Hey, Tom, thanks a lot for coming on the show. I'm really happy to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. Oh, you know, my pleasure, Tom. Uh, you're a person I've been I, I've been mean to have on the podcast for a while. Uh, you know, I really admire, you know, your work and the work that you and Scott do for Screenwriting Masterclass. And, uh, you know, it's good that we could actually, you know, have this conversation now. Oh, it's great. I'm glad I'm glad you've been enjoying classes and it's been good to have you in with us in our in our classes. Oh yeah, I've been enjoying the classes a lot, um, and you know, there's a question I usually uh, uh, ask most people. Uh, you know, when, I, when we start off, is I want to ask Tom. You know, how did you get started? You know, in, in the film industry. Um, how did I get started? Well, I I we fell in love with movies when I was a kid, and uh, we had a neighbor who was a a, a filmmaker. And Burt Balaban, and we were on the set of his movies a couple of times, and I just loved to go to the movies. I have this weird, I, you know, there were these movie theaters in our town, and I would go and see the West. We'd go to see the, you know, when I was a little kid, the, the you know, 20 cartoons, matinee in the afternoon, and then an Abbott and Costello movie. And uh, my mom, my parents really liked movies. My mom really liked movies. So, like, the first movie I saw in a theater was uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai, 
in she took us to New York and saw that in a theater when I was a little kid. So you know, I was just um, I really um, I just always really loved movies, and I would just go. I I I wouldn't go by myself when I was a kid, but I have this one memory of I really wanted to go see this this western that was playing. And my friend Larry didn't want to go. So I actually said, okay, I'll buy your ticket. So I like paid for him to go just so we would do that in that afternoon. I think the movie was, she wore a yellow ribbon, you know, and I have no idea what, you know, how that whatever promotion for that movie made me want to see it. But um, yeah, so I just really liked movies. And then when I was in college, I started making films and I just, you know, decided that's what I wanted to do. And at that time, there was sort of the 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 seventies and the eighties was a great time for movies. There's a lot of excitement, and there were a lot of film students who were breaking into film. And I did my junior year abroad in Paris, and went to film school, and made a film. It was actually in French. It was my student film, and uh, I I I then came out to California when I finished school with my French student film under my arm and a spec script that I'd written and uh tried to uh, make my way and you know sell the script and get work and uh that was a process but um it, then you know I, I worked at you know, I did like different kinds of jobs and uh this guy uh, hired me to to write and direct an educational film which was like a, it was a story film it was sort of a red balloon kind of film and I, I made that film and it won an award in a festival which kind of gave me a little bit of hope and I kept writing scripts along the way and then I, I got an agent and had some jobs and uh, you know but nothing to uh, to nothing that really panned out into anything they were fun and interesting jobs that I had I optioned a script to a guy which is actually uh, Rick Rosenthal who became a, a director and TV director and still very active out here as a company called Whitewater. And so I, I optioned the script to him. And uh, then I wrote a script that uh, got, um, got some interest from Bob Zemeckis through my brother was, was a lawyer and he was working with Larry Kasdan and Zemeckis was a friend of his. And I wrote the script, my brother liked the script and he gave it to those guys he gave it to Kazan and Kazan gave it to Zemeckis and Zemeckis really loved the script and he wanted to make the movie. So, you know, that was sort of, that was my first uh, taste of anything which really uh, was going to be, you know, breaking into the, the you know, so sort of scaling the walls of the studios, so to speak. And uh, that project ended up, nothing ended up happening with it. You know, we, because Bob Zemeckis, I thought, you know, it was like this, he had done um, used cars and I want to hold your hand. He was Spiel, He and Bob Gale were Spielberg's sort of protégés of the time. And uh, then Spielberg directed their script, 1941, which was a huge flop at the time. You know, it was just like a big, you know, it was like Spielberg's first movie that he'd made that hadn't worked. So when Zemeckis got interested in my script, it was like the tail end of his that first wave of what he you know had going in the business. So it wasn't the greatest of times for him, but you know he loved my script and he wanted to do it. And he you know we took it to all these places and nothing happened with it. So I you know I was kind of charged by that. You know I felt like wow you know it was like more than it ever happened to me, and it was exciting and it was it was a fun thing. And I you know we were still I was still kicking that script around, trying to do things with it, and working on another script. And then about six months later, the phone rang and it was Zemeckis, and he said, I, I hey Tom, I have this project at at Fox, and uh, they I need a writer to develop it with me. Would you be interested? And, um, you know, I, yeah, of course I was interested. So that was Cocoon. It was this unpublished novel. And uh, there was a, the producers were these mega producers, uh, Richard's, Richard Zanuck and David Brown. You know, they'd done Jaws and Sting and all these things. They had this big deal at Fox. So he had that deal with developing that project with him. And there, a writer had done an adaptation. It was an unpublished novel. And this guy... Had done an adaptation of it, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't really no one was very happy with it, and so 
they gave me the, the material and said, well, you know, what, what do you, can you do something with it? So I, you know, figured out a pitch and um, had to go in and, you know, I pitched it to Bob, tried to figure out something that like would sort of work with his sensibility in terms of what the material was. And I kind of reinvented what they had before and reinvented the novel and novel, the novel in a lot of ways and used the story and just changed a lot of elements, characters and things to it. Um, and kept some, you know, the, the basic sci-fi story that was there. I, I, I stuck with that. And, uh, you know, it was about the, 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 you know, the story is exactly what the movie is, but, you know, many adjustments later, I think. And uh, so, yeah, pitched that at, um, to Zanuck and Brown and Lily Zanuck, Richard Zanuck's wife. And uh, yeah, they, they bought, the, you know, they, they hired me to write that script. And uh, so that was my first, that, and that, you know, amazingly, there was all this drama at the studio, you know, the studio, Zemeckis then went off to do Romancing the Stone and uh, he, they ended up having a lot of problems with the studio, Romancing the Stone and our movie, Cocoon, I wrote the script and it got green lit. You know, it was like they wanted to make that movie with Zemeckis, but then he was off making this other movie for Fox and they are having all this, he was really tangling with some people with, with Michael Douglas and other people at the studio about that project in some ways. So it ended up, they ended up not wanting him to direct Cocoon. So we had this movie that was green lit and we didn't have a director. And then it was some, I then suggested Ron Howard because of Splash and miraculously Ron Howard was, had read the script before and, and was interested in the project and, you know, the producers convinced him to do it. And so, you know, that's, and that was my, you know, my big wave. That was my way in. That was my first writer's guild job. And that was my, you know, first, uh, you know, movie that got made. So, so after that, Tom, did did you get a lot of like people wanting to work with you, and like a lot of directors wanted to, wanting to sit down with you to talk about their projects? Yeah, I mean that was like, yeah, it was pretty, you know, it was like such, yeah, I I was, I mean, you know, because well, once the movie got going, I started getting, you know, some work started coming my way, you know, with other other producers wanted to work with me because the movie was, you know, in development. I was sort of like, you know, in the game a little bit, so to speak. And then when the movie came out and it turned out to be a hit and, you know, and it was, it was, it was well liked by people in the, in the, in, by the people in the business. It was just, you know, people really, really, really were very kind about the movie. And uh, so, yeah, I just started getting, you know, it, and the business was so different than the studio system, you know, the studio, like Cocoon would not get made now. I mean, it might get made somehow. Someone would struggle and fight and get it made, but, you know, it was like a $20 million, at that time, a $20 million movie, which is a very low budget studio movie, about as low as you could do at a studio at that time, I think, and with no stars. Uh, you know, Steve Gutenberg wasn't really, a, you know, he was a star, but he wasn't, you know, like a, a movie star. He wasn't a, you know, he wasn't a guy who was known to just, you know, put to get movies, any movie couldn't put, be put together with, with him and at that time so um yeah so that was you know th then you know yeah people just started throwing me every kind of job you could imagine you know it was just like yeah things changed so i got i just got a lot of work after that definitely definitely a lot of you know things going on that way you know you touched on something too tom that i, that I wanted to talk about which was you mentioned you know that movie wouldn't get made today and, you know, I, I think you're right because I, I, you know, everything now is either like a low budget, you know, one to five million dollar movie or it's a huge superhero movie. And, you know, that that's something now where I wonder, you know, where where is that middle ground that that used to be? You know what I mean? And so, you know, where I wanted to ask you is is <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to ask you is is, you know, what would you do if you were a screenwriter starting off right now? You know, what would you do, you know, to sort of, you know, get your foot in the door again, knowing the, the, the marketplace is where it is right now? Uh, I would just write a, I would write a great script in whatever, whatever you are interested that writers feels they have in their heart that they can embrace a hundred percent and really feel committed to emotionally and, and spiritually and physically and just like, you know, on, on every level and just write a great script. 
And if you write a great script, then you have a writing sample. And, you know, in terms of the practicalities of what can get made, yeah, you know, it's it's better to write something that can be made for a price. And that even if the marketplace doesn't allow for that kind of thing as much, if you want to be in the feature game, you got, you have to write a feature film. And, you know, so, and it may be that, writing an enclosed a low something low doing you know mixing it up writing some write, writing something that's you know an enclosed thriller or something that's extremely low budget that you know can be really made cheaply and yet is a genre film um i think that's something that the studios are interested in uh, it's you know i think that if you if you embrace a genre you you if you want to work for the studios if you want to work in that context you kind of have to look at the movies that they're making and embrace that kind of movie and do something which demonstrates that you are, can do that better than anybody else that they're going to have. So, you know, that they're, my agent has all these writers working for Marvel, you know, I mean, so, you know, so there, there are these, there are people who are specialists in that and that's, that's, the, they've dedicated themselves to that. They love that, and that's what they do, and that's the kind of work that they're getting. And they may have come at it from somewhere else. They may have written something that was a more specific sp- sci-fi or very you know heightened kind of action film that got them there, but something that really corresponds to what that realm is and to the kind of kind of scenes and the kind of character development, the kind of stories that are in that genre. And you know, there are like there are other kinds of genres. That you know, there's the horror genre, and uh, you know, there's there's a few you know, there's action thrillers, uh, you know, one character action thrillers, which is probably you know the the most you know a simpler version of uh, you know of, of a less expensive kind of movie that the studios can make, where they can make it with one star, and if it's you know if it's a compelling story original, it can be you know I think it's going to be the next Taken or something like that. So that's that's the way in and it's much more limited you know i mean the the i when i you know there used to be development executives it used to be a point of pride that a development executive would have two projects that were that they loved but were very difficult to get off the ground or sort of impossible but they loved them so they had you know so that those people aren't that's not something that is part of the part of the mix right now the people who are left as the development executives are you know they're it's business you know it's just very you know it's pared down to the being specific to what the necessities of international distribution are and that's you know that's the studios and then there's television you know i think that television is kind of that picked up the slack and all these people are moving into television and the television is just taking a lot of different forms and you know, six episode series or 10 episodes series, you know, cable shows are 10 episodes and for a season and that's it. And then there are, you know, Netflix does these small films. Now there's Tallulah, Tallulah just came out on Netflix. which is a good little film with, with um, Ellen Page and uh, Allison Janney, uh, which is like Juno. It's, but it's straight up there on, on Netflix and Boz Lorman's doing the get down on, on Netflix. It's a really interesting show. So, Television is really, and what I was saying about te- in television, there's you know limited series are are significant, and series that have few episodes are significant. So something that could be a feature film could also be put into one of those contexts. But you know, and also making and making your own film, making an independent film, or just trying to do something that's really small that goes to the independent market. And there's not a lot of money in that, but. Uh, if your heart is in a, is in a, in an idea in a project, you you kind of have to you kind of have to do it and and try and find a way. And people find a way. Things rise up. You know, everybody's hoping that this year that at the festivals and wherever that some great stuff is going to rise up. So if people keep making movies and keep writing scripts, and then good things will happen. Yeah, you know, you made a, another good point, Tom, which is about TV. You know, that's where a lot of good writers now uh, that even you know that I even know personally are all aiming for TV now rather than feature films. And I think part of the reason is is because of uh, of the budget issue, where you know you want to make a feature film 
you know, and they, they look at it and they go, well, you know, maybe this would be better as episodic because that's, you know, everyone has been, you know, conditioned to, to, to binge watch it or, you know what I mean? And there's, and we're in the golden age of TV. There's so many good TV shows on, uh, you know, out there. And, you know, I, I think, you know, even some of the producers that maybe would have made those movies, those feature films, even a few years ago, have maybe too much on their plate uh, or they just aren't making those types of movies anymore. Yeah, I think you have a I mean, they're not there. It's hard for the producers. The producers are reluctant to develop a lot of things because it's really hard to set them up. It's just they don't, you know, the studios aren't giving the producers budgets for development and uh, they're just not buying. It's not a, it's a, it's, it's, it, they they only buy, they buy scripts when they're going to go into production a lot of the time now, apparently. So yeah, it's TV is really picking up the slack and, uh, you know, and, and I, I think that it's, it's this breakdown, which is occurring in the, the, but I think that, you know, once things eventually the, the theatrical, the theatrical film is not going to go away it's that form is important and people don't just want to watch series people don't always want to just get hooked into something that's going to take them 10 hours to watch they want to sit down with a group of people or by themselves and watch something that's two hours and that's that form is primal to film entertainment so it's not going anywhere it's just right now we're in kind of a it's in kind of a downswing in terms of the um certain sectors of the kinds of films that are getting made um, and it's it's probably going to it's probably going to change and it may not be that the movie theaters are going to be as important as they were. But I think that there's still there's always going to be room for for a good movie, for a good script and a good movie. It's just but I think that in practical terms, do having a, a TV script is something where people feel like they can do something with it. There's there's all these channels, there's all these outlets that are all looking for stuff. So, you know, and there, you know, if you take the difference between the way that uh, Warner Brothers is trying to find material for movies, Warner, Warner Brothers films versus the way that AMC, the AMC channel is looking for projects, I would guess that AMC is is a lot more, you know, fun place to go to if you really want to sell something these days. Yeah, you know, because AMC, you know, with The Walking Dead, and they also had Breaking Bad, and, uh, you know, and, and you know, I, like you said, though, a lot of people are, are taking more chances, because, you know, I, I heard uh, a rumor that Voodoo, which is owned by Walmart, is going to start making their own original content, because everyone wants to get into that game of creating their own original, you know, movies and TV shows. Yeah, I mean, someone, th- this idea of the content bubble is uh you know they said two years ago somebody said that there was a content bubble and it was going to go all you know there were too many shows and all this well the bubble hasn't gone away and uh you know i, I was the, the the truth is that a show that a, a cable show that is doing really well it, the number of people who are actually watching it it would be canceled it would have been canceled 15 years ago if it were a network show so it doesn't have to do that much business it's like this it's kind of this large scale version of the long tail where people you know where there are, there are so many niches you know and and if you if you fit into a niche and you write something of quality or create a show of quality that really that people who are inch, passionate about that niche and beyond you know respond to then you know it's it's going to it's going to work so you have all these channels and they're all they're all looking for stuff they're all looking for ways to survive or make themselves more prominent than they are and so you know you so there all these channels you never heard of are all sort of have one eye on uh doing some you know some kind of sh- tv series or some kind of filmed entertainment show that's not just what their standard mix might be so, yeah, so there's, you know, there's a lot going on. There's also, you know, things that are just on the web, just web series. And, uh, you know, there are these um, verticals, which are groups, groupings together, group, group together um, web shows that are, you know, just a bunch of web channels that are, that are, that are part of one organization. And there's just going to be more, that's just starting. And now it's, you know, people, you know, treat it like, oh, you know, some people love YouTube and some people feel like, they don't relate to it and they feel like it's not for them. And they, then they generalize that that realm is never going to be something that they would ever want to work in. Well, 
it's going to evolve. I mean, all these things are going to evolve. Maybe it won't be YouTube specific. Maybe YouTube will will stay the the realm of of what it is now, which is you know I I I, I enjoy some of the things that are on there, but it may be that it will really you know there'll be more diversification. There'll be more different kinds of shows even within YouTube. So there's plenty of there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of you know a lot of ways to go and you can you know having a good script is is a beginning and then being industrious about figuring out where it can fit in you know uh we just were talking about web series too uh cuz uh you know I took that class with you about creating a web series and you know that is something too I you know I've noticed was that there's more web uh, web series competitions springing up more and more uh, you know, and, and they're very open because there's no, you know, set page count. You know what I mean? Like, so some can, you know, they're like, hey, if you're if your uh, entry is five pages or whether it's 25 pages, as long as you're, you know, you have this concept for for, you know, the channel or for the project in general, you know, you will, will accept these entries. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can it, it can be whatever you want it to be. I mean, someone can define if, if something's really compelling and it's 30 minutes, it's people are going to watch it. I mean, it's just a matter of a matter of doing something that's of quality and doing something that really, you know, that, that really is, you know, outstanding for people and satisfies and, you know, is resonant. And I think, you know, you can bring the same skill sets of, and the same, same emotional tools that you bring, put in a, in a screenplay to this, these short forms. And you can also use the short form to boost a, you know, boost a script or a movie. There's a lot more of people putting together reels to try and sell projects. You know, they sort of like to really investing in whatever their idea is and, and, and having a way to present it that really injects it into people's heads in a creative way. So it may not just be reading the script. It's, you know, there's, there's more to it. And that's, you know, it'd be, as a writer, I would prefer if it was just this level pl- playing field and it was this orderly situation where people were reading the scripts and then, you know, making rational decisions about them after having, you know, a good experience reading the script. But there's, it's gotten, m- there, people are doing more and more to try and, uh, and, and enhance the possibilities of something, get people's attention to, 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 to the material that they have. Yeah, uh, one one common tactic that I've seen is to make something into like a uh, a transmedia project, you know, where it's you know a web series and uh, or or it starts off as a novel and then you make the movie or then you write the script and say, hey, it's based off the uh, the novel by the same writer. Uh, you know, I, I've seen people, you know, more people trying to package things. You know, like we were talking about setting setting up projects. And you know what they would try to do is also get Facebook page uh, fan pages or sorry Facebook fans for their page, uh, you know Twitter followers, and that way when you're pitching to people, they can say, "Hey, look, we already have you know ten thousand people on the on this on this fan page." Yeah, and that you know that speaks to the idea that you can so much that you can do yourself, and that you can't you know that that whole the other going back to the the feature realm. You know, there's this, you know, people who are doing a, a Kickstarter, you know, you, you can get a movie done that way. Uh, you can, you know, if you have a script and if you, you know, you, you have to, it's, it, there's a whole, there's an art and a science to doing Kickstarter or Seed and Spark. And that's a way to build the following for your, your script and kind of fi- figure out, well, is there, you know, find the audience for it. And then if you do, if you do a Kickstarter and you start a Facebook page and you do all these things and people, and you're able to um, communicate what your film is and get people and people resonate with it, then that's, you know, that's the kind of the test of, you know, if, if you do that, then your, your project it bodes well for your project so you know so it's a good thing to do but again that's it's really like it's just not just the, not just having the script but then doing all these other things and sometimes rather than going around and trying to get sort of go around to the agents and managers and producers and try and get permission to do something which you know or get them to approve what you've done so that they can then go out and market it if you really just go into the trenches with it and just, you know, try and try and figure out a way to get it done yourself or that, that may be more productive ultimately. So. Yeah. 
Very, very true, Tom. You know, Tom, I wanted to, you know, ask, as you know, we can turn our conversation about, you know, making projects, you know, what sort of advice, you know, would you give to somebody who was, uh, you know, who was thinking about writing a screenplay? Uh, for, for, you know, I, I usually say beginners, but if you don't mind, Tom, what would you say to somebody who maybe even is beyond a beginner and maybe like intermediate to advanced? You know, what would you give, you know, any advice to them about, about you know, sort of write for writing for their next screenplay, whether it be about structure or whether it be about about concept is there any anything you know, that you could comment about um i would say you no know, great character driving plot great characters and uh really um having a you know making sure that your movie is really about something and you know working working to the heart of what it is and uh you know that's probably you know just 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 giving it giving your project now i've been saying this a lot giving your project love you know giving it all the love you can and and really you know make it great and uh you know be, and be able to enunciate what it is really say say what it is and not to oversimplify it but to really s- sort of have an i you know be able to be clear you know you might not know it when you start out what it was really about, but by the, or you, or you might not know what sort of the mirror, you know, what the important things that your characters go through that they really discover about themselves or what they, you know, what they finally conquer, or just like, you know, what that could mean to people who would be hearing about the project. So they hear about, you know, they might hear about a high concept, some, some sort of hook of what the plot is or where it takes place, which sounds really, Oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard that. You know, that's, I haven't heard, that sounds, I'd like to see that. But then if the closer is, and this person, this guy or this woman, they, what they, what happened to them, the the main characters experience in their own life on, in their own terms of what happens to them through, through the story, which is going to translate to, you know, it's going to be the people who hear the story, watch the film or read the script. They're going to, they're going to grow from whatever that growth is that takes place in the character. And, you know, sometimes that's not it. Sometimes characters don't change. They don't grow. And it's not every movie and not to be formulaic that has to be that way. But I think that even if that's not the case, the the character will have, there's a certain kind of heart story that will take place at the center of, of most films, which is what people remember. That's what people, re- that's why people remember movies is because of that, Sort of story within the story, and you know I'm I'm always chasing it down with my own stuff, and uh, I, you know sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I start with a story that's very external, and you have to start somewhere, and you not re- you may not know what it's really about until you've written it, and you can outline and outline and outline. But I think in the in writing is where if you really let yourself go in your writing, if you really you know take the ride with it you'll discover what you'll learn, what you're, you'll, you know, it's, it's in you and you're sort of the instrument that's going to get it out, but it's going it, to, it, you want it to have a life of its own on the page. Yeah, you know, uh, and even in talking with Scott, uh, you know, uh, you know, Scott Myers, the other half of Screenwriting Masterclass for those listening, uh, you know, we were talking about character and how character is everything uh, because character suggests plot. You know, ca- everything comes from character, you know, and, and those moments, mom- moments where they change in the film, that all comes from, you know, their character and, and either wanting or needing to change. And, you know, this whole idea where you can, you know, sort of take a, uh, you know, an outline, formulaic outline and just plug whatever in there, I think is a downfall to a lot of screenwriters because I've seen them, you know, try to say, oh, man, you know, on page 17, I got to have this. And on page 30, I got to have this. And, and, and you know, you, you just go, you know, you wonder why why movies become formulaic. Well, it's because of stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that, you know, I mean, the the, the form, you know, the formulas or the dramatic structure wasn't wasn't invented before the story the first stories were told the stories were told naturally people just told stories and then after a while people sat down well why is everybody listening to him or her you know and then they realized oh well you know this is where you know they they set it up here and they you know they worked it and then they oh there was this point where Everything went went downhill completely to the bottom. The main character they all bottomed out, 
and then there was this lift, you know, at the, so yeah, they figured they, maybe they saw that in what the, but the stories came first. And so there was no theory. So, and the theory is a way to sort of, you know, sometimes you may write just, okay, I know I'm going to need these things and it's a way to start writing. It's a way to get going, but you want to just let the story, you want to just kind of find the story in its rawest form. And then it may be misshapen in some way, or it may be missing some elements like, you know, and then you can go to the formula or go to those models of how, how scripts are structured and, you know, the idea, the lessons about dramatic structure and just sort of measure what you have against those ideas about structure. And it might say, wow, you know, I never really, I, I didn't really explore my characters in enough before the the point you know before the the you know when everything got really bad the all's lost moment so to speak you know so you can use it to kind of diagnose but you may not want to necessarily start you may want to write instinctively at first and then see how it fits into those structural models as kind of a remedy it's like in acting you know the method method acting you know is, is this way of, of this this way of sort of imagining i'll oversimplify it but it's if a character if an actor has a part that they're doing they may dig deep in their own experience to find moments that will make them feel the moments in their real life that made them feel in a similar way to the characters the way the character might be feeling because of what's going on in the story so they'll plug that in and they'll realize okay at that point i'm going to think about when my, you know, when, when I saw the elephant get euthanized or whatever it is, you know, so that'll make me cry. So they'll, and maybe in the movie, they're watching, you know, something completely, you know, they're observing a soldier dying in a bed or something, you know, whatever it is, but they use that emotional moment from their real life to sort of, sort of make themselves feel and appear or the way that they're supposed to fear appear. And that's method acting. But some actors may need to do that every second of a, you know, how complicated would that be? Every moment you're trying to scotch tape together, something that happened from when your life, I think most of the time, most actors, even method actors are just imagining it. They're just, they jump into the character and they imagine it. And then they reach a bump in the road at a certain point where, you know, they're facing that soldier dying in the bed and they just, they're just not feeling it or they just don't feel like they really have a clear understanding of what it would really, they can't bring, they're just looking for more from what they want to be from their performance. So in that piece of the, of their performance, they may use that idea from that, that experience from their real life and bring it in and then just use that there. So that, and then it, on film people, you know, it, it will work really well because they're, they seem to be, have, the emotion is really, you know, appropriate for what there's, they would, for, for what's going on at that point. And it could be a great performance, but that's, that's a technique. And that's may not be a technique that is used every second of, of, you know, it's just like, you don't do that all the time. An actor doesn't do that all the time. Just the same way a writer may not use the form, you know, the, the formulas all the time as they write they may just write and when they hit that bump in the road or when they just want something more they feel like there's something missing then they'll go to the technique then they'll go to the formulas and, and, and use it as a as a helper so it, you know and it's also something too tom you know as we talk you know about about writing and you know and we talk about outlining because you know when i when i've outlined and then i sort of actually write it uh, I've had a lot of aha moments as I'm actually writing, you know, I'm sort of like, Oh, okay. You know, maybe this could happen. You know what I mean? You start getting these ideas that you sort of maybe can't see with the outline because the outline really ends up becoming like a lot of broad strokes, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I've learned too, is, you know, as we're making this outline to really get in there and it, it's, you're able to sort of now say, okay, now this scene has to come out of this scene and now, now we can do this. And, you know, within this scene, this is how this reversal happens in this scene, because, you know, it started off with guy A has all the power and then it ends with guy B having all the power, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I think I, I completely agree. I think that, you know, I, I feel sometimes I feel like I outline too much and that I'd be better off just writing pages 
and then I sort of want to be, I want to be writing pages, just to let myself be writing pages. And then there's this fear that, oh no, if I write, if I write pages, you know, I'll just, I'm going to write myself into a hole with a stuff that doesn't make sense. And, and I, you know, but I think that there is a point where you really want to, you know, you want to write. And I think in some ways you can, I, I also like to, and I advise get start writing go forward see what see what's going to happen and then go back to your outline and play with your outline based on what you write you know restructure based on the inspiration that comes from the writing because it it will change it should change you know if you're writing for you know if, if you have a, a a deadline and you have a producer you know a company or something and they're you've, they've approved an outline well that's different you know you, you can you can diverge a little bit but you may have to stick with it, but you know, if you're just writing your own script, you just just like, you know, let, free yourself up. You know. Yeah, I, I I know exactly what you mean, and you know, I because I, I actually you know I started off writing feature films, and now I actually just wrote two TV pilots, right. uh, one half hour, one drama, and now you know I sort of I I, I see you know. As it, talking with like Jennifer Grassani, as she was on the podcast a few episodes ago, you know, we we're, we're talking about creating that Bible, uh, you know, and just creating a pitch and then making sure that all this stuff is set so that, you know, they know that you have a vision of where this is going to go. And, you know, the whole thing sort of, it sort of fold, folds back You know, you have the vision of where it's going to go in the series arc, what's going to happen in season one, which, you know, in, which is the season one arc. And then you have the entire, you know, episodic arc about that season. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, putting all this stuff together and you realize, you know, making a TV pilot is actually really, really difficult. And I, and I, and I actually might venture off Tom and saying, you know, pound for pound, it might be the most difficult of, of doing all this stuff, you know, whether we're talking about writing web series or feature films or TV, you know, I think TV writing, it writing a TV pilot because you have to get everything in motion and you have to, you know, make sure that you know it's 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 intriguing and all that stuff. And you have to introduce all these characters within you know thirty and you know one hour. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. It's really hard. And you know, I think the idea of having to present this—they want more. You know, they want an episode and you know the pilot and then outlines for a couple episodes and then the whole you know a season summer you know a season bible of some sort or just you know descriptions of many many things it's really it's like you're pre-writing a novel it's it's pretty it's tough you know and and you can get away i think you can get away with less if you have a really strong pilot but you do have to give them a lot i i was speaking with a writer you know who's done a lot of a lot of stuff and he was he was saying that um um that they that it's that that most of the that the speculation of the season of the bible is just like bs that most of the time it's not going to end up that way you know that you can't really know you can't really predetermine the season from just writing the pilot and maybe some people can i don't know i don't know if that's okay but there are buyers who are buying the entire you know Amazon, they're just buying the entire season so that that's really what you're, you know, you're going in and they, they, you want to sell them, you know, the, 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 the production of an entire season of the show. So you, you better have something planned. Yeah. And, and you're right. It is like setting up a novel. It's, um, you know, cause you have to make sure they, they, they know they they have to make sure that you know where this is going. You know, it's not just sort of like the pilot, and then you're like, well, I got to kind of figure out where everything goes from here. Um, you know, and speaking of writing for TV, you actually have an upcoming uh, TV writing class, correct, Tom? I do. I have one. It's start. It's this week. Are you, when is this airing? I have I have I have a one week class this week, and then in September I have a uh, a pilot workshop that's going to be going on. So uh, this will this will be airing about two weeks. So maybe um, beginning of September. Yeah. Oh, l let me tell you. Oh, here, I'll, let me get the dates here for you. If I can figure that out here. One second. Sure. Bye. Two weeks. Okay. September 5th, right after Labor Day, I have a Pages 1, writing the first draft. That's a feature class. And then on September 12th, I have Pages 2. I, it's a uh, rewrite class for features. And I, we also do TV pilots in there as well. So it's, you know, that one, 
um, both both can be in there. And then on the 26th of September, I have a, a, a Pages TV original TV pilot script workshop. So that's a, a 10 week pilot workshop where we you know we work out a whole series concept and pilot script in that class. So I have those things upcoming at uh, Screenwriting Masterclass online. Uh, very cool, Tom. Uh, you know, so you know, uh, and I'll make sure to link to those in the show notes, everyone. And you, in, in closing, Tom, because I know we're just about out of time, is there anything that we didn't discuss, or anything you sort of want to say to put a period at the end of this conversation? Uh, well, it was it was great speaking with you, and uh, yeah, I I just in, I encourage people to uh, to to write to tell their stories, and just you know, I think that. The, pro, the writing itself, and uh, you know, create, doing cre- doing creative writing, and uh, you know, concentrating in a in a form like screen screenwriting or pilot writing. I think that it, it's its own reward, and simultaneously, there's a, there's a great world out there. And uh, as much as we're you know we 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 still have one foot in the way things were in feature films, and we we're, we've actually move forward into some this new realm in film entertainment and it's really and it, it's it's an incredible because of the, the changes in technology and the changes in lifestyle that have been going on it's an incredible time for film entertainment and uh, it's an incredible visual time people, visual elements are so important and film video and filmed elements on the on the web in all ways are so important so imagining out these stories in the script form it's just a great thing to do, and uh, it's important to have fun with it and uh, to you know love find out what the shows are and the and the the movies are that you really love and keep watching and keep reading and um, you know that's that's about all that's 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 it you know. very cool Tom and where can people find you out online uh screenwriting dot com if anybody has any questions i'm tom t o m at screenwritingmasterclass.com and uh, I also have a podcast which I started very recently which we have the first three episodes are up it's called theprocess.ink and we're on iTunes and uh, we're talking about the just like right here we're talking about the creative process and I've had some amazing you know I had uh, today I spoke with uh, Billy Finkelstein who's you know he's he's a he's on the writing staff of uh the spinoff to the good wife and he did the the feature he did he wrote the uh the, this uh bad lieutenant re, bad lieutenant uh, city of city of new orleans that Werner Herzog directed with uh um uh, with Nicolas Cage which was a very good film he just he did that so we talked about that and he, he worked on LA Law and he worked on Cop Rock and he's a good friend of David Milch and uh the real interesting guy. He's worked on all these different shows, he worked on Law and Order and now he's on this this show at CBS. So we talked about, you know, running shows and creating shows and I've had I've had uh um I'm gonna be talking with uh, Beck Smith, who's an indie uh, specialist at United Talent Agency next week, and uh, I'm going to be speaking to someone who works at Upright Citizens Brigade and Stand Up Comic, and uh, I'm going to be, and I've had other interesting guests. So, the process.ink, please check it out. And uh, any requests for kinds of guests, I'm open to feedback about what I'm doing on the show. Excellent. And I, I will also link to that in the show notes, everyone. Uh, you can always find me at DaveBullis.com and Twitter. It's at Dave underscore Bullis. Tom, I want to say thank you very much for coming on the show, sir. Thank you very much. This is a pleasure. And I hope we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. And I'll see you in the Warner Herzog class. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna <laughs> both, uh, yeah, it's, it's a small world. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I know, Tom, I, I, I know we'll, we'll, our pairs will cross again very soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. T- take care, Tom. Take care. Bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.